All right. Well, thank you so much for that great introduction. And thank you very much. This sounds a little loud. Is this sounding a little loud to everybody? It sounds loud to me. Thank you very much to Dr. Pitts for inviting me here. This is my first time to Wayne State University and my first time to Detroit. So it's been uh, really fun to see a part of the country that I really don't know yet. And it's uh, great to have you all here. We're a pretty small bunch, so, and I realize that some of you are not scientists and not atmospheric scientists, and so if I say anything that isn't clear or you want to get a little better explanation for, please raise your hand or yell or throw something or whatever to get my attention and we'll, we'll get it sorted out. So um, please don't hesitate to ask questions along the way. So as uh, Dr. Pitts mentioned, I'm going to be talking about this pretty new research that I've been involved with lately. Um, most of my career has been involved with studying the Arctic itself and how it works and what was causing it to warm so fast, what was causing the sea ice to disappear, which I'm going to show you quite a bit of in a couple of minutes here. But since the Arctic really started to change in the mid-1990s or so, it occurred to me that when you change a part of the Earth's system, a piece that's so critical to its energy balance and really its entire circulation system, then you've got to make changes to the whole circulation system. So this is really what launched this research. And it's really just in the last two and a half years or so that I've been pursuing this particular topic with my colleague, uh, Steve Vavris, at the University of Wisconsin, just up the road from here. So as David mentioned, um, you might remember last winter, although you might have blanked it out of your mind because it was not so much fun for you guys around here. This is actually Chicago, not Detroit. But this is pretty much how Chicago looked for a lot of last winter. And a friend of mine, um, as I was sort of involved in the controversy around this whole winter pattern and whether it was related to climate change and all that sort of stuff, sent me this cartoon, which I thought really summed things up quite well. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of whining went on last winter. And for some reason, people were blaming me for this very cold winter. So, um, and we weren't the only ones that experienced a really tough year. This is what the west coast of the UK looked like for much of its winter. It was bombarded by storm after storm. They broke their all-time precipita precipitation record for the country, um, which goes back over 250 years. Very unusual winter. And we see that this is not the only kind of um, extreme event that's on the rise. So what I'm showing you here is actually some analysis done by an insurance company, a reinsurance company as a matter of fact, Munich RE. And they care a lot about extreme weather events because of course, you know, they're the ones shelling out the money when something happens. But what they're showing here is that going back to the 1990s, these are various kinds of extreme events that they've had to um, insure people for. So the red color here are the types of extreme events related to things like tsunamis and earthquakes. And what you see is that they are not changing in frequency over time. So this goes almost to present here. But these other colors are the types of events that are related to weather and climate change. So we have meteorological events in green, hydrological events, so that would be floods, and climatological events, which they're relating to extreme temperatures, droughts, forest fires, that sort of thing. So what you see is that there's a definite uptick over time in those types of extreme events. But as you know, these kinds of events come in many different flavors. And let's just take a quick look around the Northern Hemisphere and see what's been happening over just the last couple of years. So I already showed you some flooding in the UK, but we've had a very stormy time the last few winters along the uh, coast of New England, which is where I live now. Lots of nor'easters. Again, that flooding in England that happened this past winter that broke its all-time record for precipitation. Even places like Alaska in September of 2012, they had an unprecedented flood event there. And Greenland, you don't think of Greenland and flooding usually going hand in hand, but in fact, that same summer, Greenland experienced some very bad flooding and that bridge actually got washed away. There were cold events. Europe has had some extremely cold winters lately. 
And some of that cold and snow is extended to places where you don't usually expect to find cold and snow, like the south shore of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And some of the residents of Eastern Europe have been really upset by this change in the weather. And even places that typically get a lot of snow have been seeing an extreme amount of snow. So this is up in north, northern Japan, and you can't even imagine the snow plow that they must use to keep that road clear. And then there have been the heat waves. So here's a typical beach scene, you know, everybody's looking happy until you realize that this is in March in Burlington, Vermont. It was over 85 degrees. And in parts of our country, we know uh, west in particular, the drought has been very persistent. Marinas in Texas are no longer marinas. They've had droughts and heat waves in Eurasia as well. And we know that California is experiencing a very bad drought right now that's ongoing and predicted to continue. So these are all a certain kind of extreme events. And what do they all have in common? Well, these are the kinds of extreme events that I'm talking about. They're related to weather patterns that seem like they get stuck. Very persistent weather patterns that lead to extreme events. So, for example, if it's dry for a week, you know, if you don't get any rain, that's no problem. But if it goes on for weeks and weeks, then we start talking about drought. So when weather patterns get very persistent, they can lead to certain times of extreme events. And those are the kinds of events that I'm talking about with the work that I'm going to be showing you today. So people are noticing that the weather patterns really are changing. Not only do the statistics tell us that extreme events are increasing, but people are sensing it themselves in their own backyard. And they're starting to wonder whether climate change might be playing a role. Well, this question was kind of a prickly one for scientists up until very recently, because the understanding was that you know weather happens and climate change is happening, but really the two are not linked. But recently, in the last five or so years, there have been a lot of papers coming out looking at these extreme events and relating them to changes in the climate system. So that now more and more of us are more than willing to say yes indeed. We are seeing certain type of types of extreme events linked to climate change. So let's step back for a minute and see what's been happening over the last thousand years or so. So this is a graph showing how the Earth's average temperature has changed over this thousand years. So here's a thousand years ago here. And what you see is that what we were experiencing was actually a general cooling of the Earth's average temperature. And this was because of changes in the Earth's orbit. But more recently, this red curve here is showing us what's been happening just in the last century or so. And what you see is something very different going on. We're seeing the Earth starting to respond to the fact that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now higher than it's been in at least 800,000 years. And really more like 2 million years. That's what people are starting to say now. It's so high now that it's really just completely different from anything we've seen in a very, very long time. So the Earth is responding to this increasing carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It traps the heat that the Earth emits down near the surface. And so it's like putting a thicker blanket on the Earth and keeps that heat trapped down by the surface. But what we're seeing is that the warming of the Earth is not happening uniformly around the globe. And what we're seeing here is this is latitude on this scale. So this would be Antarctica, this would be the equator, and this is the Arctic, and how the temperature changes have been happening going back to 1900, up to present day. So these yellow and red colors here are showing you where it's warmer than average, and the blues are where it's colder. So what you see is that as we get close to the present day, it's warming everywhere around the Earth, but the warming is much larger in the Arctic. And this is what David called Arctic amplification. This is this rapid warming that's happening in the Arctic. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you are younger than, say, 29 years old. So this past September was the 355th month in a row 
that was warmer than average for the 20th century. So that means if you're younger than 29 years old, you've never lived in a month that was cooler than average. It's kind of an amazing thing what's happening to the Earth right now. And not good. So let's focus in on the Arctic now and see some of the changes that have been happening up there. You probably have heard in the news that the sea ice, which is the ice that floats on the Arctic Ocean, has been disappearing. Here's what the sea ice looked like about 34 years ago. So this is in September of 1980. We're looking down here on the North Pole. There's Greenland. Um, here we are way down, pretty much off the chart here. Right about there, I guess, would be Detroit. So all that pink stuff there is sea ice floating on the Arctic Ocean as seen from a satellite. This is when uh, this is during the summertime, the end of the summer in September, when the sea ice is at its smallest extent, so it covers the least amount of the ocean. Now, if we fast forward to 2012 and look at how much ice there was in 2012, you can see with your eye, you don't need any scientific instruments to, de to detect the big change in the sea ice that's happened just in these last 30 years. In fact, if we measure the extent of that sea ice we find that in 2012, it was only half as big as it was only 30 years ago. And if then if we take into account the thickness of the ice times its extent, we get the volume. The, thin, the ice is thinned as well, and so we find that the volume of the ice has actually decreased by three quarters. And this is happening in only 30 years. And you can see, looking at the colors here, compared to what it looked like before, the ice that's left is very thin, it's very broken, it's been described as rotten and slushy by people who go up there and measure it and study it. So we're just in a very different situation now. That ice that's left is very susceptible to any changes in winds or currents in the ocean, and so it's, a very, it's much more vulnerable now than it was back then. But you might be wondering, well, maybe this is just a blip, you know? Maybe it was just a bad 30 years for, this, for the sea ice. Well, we can actually go back quite a ways and see how much ice there was about 1,500 years ago. This is uh, determined by looking at the sediments at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. So 1,500 years ago up to almost present, what we see is that it fluctuates around from year to year and even decade to decade. But it's nothing like what's happening now, which is this blue part right here. So you can see that the loss of the sea ice is very different compared to anything we've seen in at least 1,500 years. But wait, this doesn't even have 2012 on it. So if we want to put the 2012 year, which broke the record for the least amount of sea ice on this chart, it doesn't even fit on the chart. So it's a very different Arctic now than it was not that long ago. So what I want to do now is show you an animation of the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean to give you a better sense for how it changes and moves from year to year. This is an animation created by NOAA and NASA together. And let me explain what you're seeing here. So we're, again, we're looking down on the Arctic Ocean. You can see some of the um, land masses that are labeled here. This blue and white stuff here is the sea ice floating on the Arctic Ocean. The colors correspond to the age of that ice. So the white ice, there's a scale down here, is between eight, nine years old. So it's been up in the Arctic Ocean for that long. The blue colors are very young ice. So ice that's only been around for a year or two. Now, the, the age of the ice is pretty closely related to the thickness of the ice. So you can look at this and think, okay, that white ice is old, but it's also really thick. And the blue ice is very thin. So what you're going to see is when I put this in motion is you're going to see the annual cycle of the ice. So it shrinks in the summer and grows in the winter. So you're going to see that blue especially coming and going. And you're going to see the general motion of the ice in the Arctic Ocean as it gets blown around mostly by the winds. And that tends to be in a clockwise direction. So let's put it, put it in motion. And the way this was measured was from satellites. So the satellite would identify a feature in the ice and then keep track of it. 
and follow it around as it moves and uh, add up how much time it's been there. So you can see the ice moving quite a bit. It's, it's, it tends to be broken. It's moved by the winds and also the currents. And you can see that it basically takes a, a clockwise motion around this part of the Arctic Ocean, and eventually it gets sent back out into the North Atlantic here, where it eventually melts. But as we get up here into the late 2000s now, what you're seeing is that thickest, oldest ice is starting, is disappearing. And if you, oops, I missed it. Um, anyway, I think you got the idea. Towards the end of that there, you saw that there was much less of that old ice left in the Arctic Ocean, and again, giving us more evidence that what we're seeing in the Arctic now is very different from anything we've ever seen before. <laughs>